All right, so I'm going to talk about imaging of renal masses. So just to start with an overview, I'll talk about phases of renal contrast enhancement, and then we'll talk about how to evaluate renal masses, looking at ultrasound, CT, and MRI. And then I'll focus on renal cell carcinoma, the key staging points, and then also different subtypes and how they differ and how you can identify them, particularly with MRI. And then we'll review some benign neoplasm focusing mainly on oncocytoma and AML, since those are the most common. And I'll kind of focus on pitfalls and things to avoid. Just a second. All right. So here we're starting with CT of phases of renal contrast. So on this image, you could, it's good to look at the aorta first to see if contrast has been administered. You can see there's nothing in the aorta. So this is the non-contrast phase. That one was easy. <laughs> and then once we give contrast, you can see the aorta is starting to enhance there. And this is the cortical medullary phase, which usually occurs about 40 seconds after the time of contrast administration. And notice how the kidneys, you can see the cortical, cortical medullary differentiation here between the cortex and the medullary pyramids. And then the, the nephrographic phase occurs here. The kidneys start to more homogeneously enhance. That occurs about 90 to 100 seconds after contrast. And then the final phase is the excretory phase. That begins around three minutes and finishes at 15 minutes or starts to wane at least at 15 minutes. Also known as the pilographic phase. And that's when you start to see contrast excreted into the collecting system. And you can see that anatomy a little bit better on coronal reformatted images. Uh, here on the cortical medullary phase, you can nicely see the cortex and the non-enhancing medullary pyramid, which subsequently enhance on that nephrographic phase. You can see this faint papillary blush on the nephrographic phase, which is normal. And sometimes that's even more robust in younger patients getting a high volume of contrast. And then the final phase, once that uh, nephrographic enhancement proceeds into the collecting system into the calyces here, then you get the excretory phase. And then you can also notice that this little hypodensity here, we can kind of miss on the cortical medullary phase. It becomes more apparent on that nephrographic phase as the parenchyma around it enhances also on this excretory phase. And um, this was just a cyst though, nothing too concerning. All right, so we'll talk about uh, renal mass evaluation. I'll start with ultrasound and CT first. So on ultrasound, we'll start with the most basic lesion. This is just a simple cyst. So you can see cysts will be totally anechoic, meaning they'll be black, and then they'll be, you'll have this increased through transmission, also known as posterior acoustic enhancement. As the beam hits the, the simple fluid, it speeds up and brightens the posterior tissues. And the walls should be thin or imperceptible on, uh, for a simple renal cyst. And when we add color Doppler flow, there shouldn't be any internal vascularity. And that's a key thing to add because there are certain mimics that can throw you off. So what about this lesion? Here we have what looks like a simple cyst, right? In the interpolar left kidney, it's anechoic, has thin or imperceptible walls. But then when we add color Doppler, whoa, that's not a simple cyst, right? We see all this turbulent flow here. And then um, that's very concerning for an AVM. And this patient had a CTA. This is a volume rendered reformat from that CTA. You can see the left artery coming out here and it's giving a branch out to this lobular hypervascular structure in the same region. And this was a renal AVM. You can see also on this coronal MIP, there's the draining vein. So be very careful. Renal AVMs can mimic cysts on grayscale images. So it's key to add color Doppler. There's also a particular neoplasm that can mimic a cyst and that is lymphoma. So lymphoma can sometimes look cystic uh, in the kidney, but it should have some internal vascularity, particularly the larger lesions. And the most common appearance for renal lymphoma is multiple masses. So you can have a solitary lymphomatous mass, but usually it's multiple. So that's another clue. So those are the two things you look for when you think you have a cyst. Is there flow? Is it actually an AVM or renal lymphoma? So for renal tumors, they can be hypoechoic or echogenic. So here's a mass that was exophytic, hypoechoic. Here's another lesion at the upper pole that was echogenic. You can't really differentiate these. Uh, they might have vascular flow. This lesion did have some robust vascularity on color Doppler, but ultrasound isn't really specific for different subtypes of tumor, at least conventional ultrasound. And this turned out to be an oncocytoma, whereas this was a renal cell carcinoma papillary subtype. But ultrasound is a great 
option if the patient cannot get contrast. Now CT is a more robust way to evaluate renal masses. So we start usually with a non-contrast CT. And again, here's a simple cyst. It has a density of nine Hounsfeld units and Hounsfeld is just the density unit that we use to evaluate attenuation on CT. So simple cysts will have a water density. And according to the ACR, American College of Radiology guidelines for renal mass evaluation, that density would be negative nine to 20 typically. So anything in that range, as long as it doesn't have septations, wall thickening, or significant calcification, you can call that a simple cyst. Now this lesion though, we look at the non-contrast density, that's 51. So we can't call that a simple cyst, right? It's above 20. Um, but keep in mind that benign hemorrhagic and pronaceous cysts can have higher density, so over 20, and they can appear indeterminate on a routine CT scan. Like this, this could be a solid neoplasm. That's where we have to do a renal mass evaluation. So on CT, a renal mass protocol requires a minimum of two phases. So a non-contrast phase and then a contrast-enhanced nephrographic phase, which remember that occurs about 95 seconds after we give IV contrast. And lesions will typically be most conspicuous in this phase because again, the kidney is fully enhancing the cortex and the medullary pyramids. So when we give contrast in this case, we wanna evaluate the difference in density between the two. So of course, <laughs> there's no universally agreed upon density difference for enhancement. Um, but according to the, the ACR findings committee, if it's 10 or less, you can confidently say it's not enhancing. And if it's 20 or more, you can confidently say it is enhancing. The problem is when you have a difference of greater than 10 and less than 20, that's kind of a gray zone for is the lesion enhancing or are we just getting pseudo enhancement like a fake out? So in this case, when we measure the density after contrast, it's 55. So that's a difference between the pre and post contrast of four. So that's left less than 10. So we can confidently say this is not enhancing. This is just a benign hemorrhagic or pronaceous cyst. And then when we look at this case, we already knew this was a simple cyst based on the non-contrast density of nine, but let's just work through it just as an example. When we give contrast, it goes up to 12. That's a difference of three. That's no enhancement. And just a simple cyst. Now you may ask, well, why is it increasing at all? Why is it going up to three? Why is it, why is it not nine on both? And that's because CT is hampered by pseudo enhancement because when you have a mass, particularly if it's surrounded by renal parenchyma, when that parenchyma enhances on the post contrast, you'll get some streak artifact across the lesion, which will artifactually elevate the density of that lesion. And, but that density should be a difference of 10 or less. Usually you won't get pseudo enhancement beyond that. Now, what about this lesion? So on non-contrast CT, we're looking at the right kidney here. There's the aorta and liver, liver as a landmarks. This measure is 23. So it's not a simple cyst. It's above 20. And then when we give contrast, it goes up to 171. So that's a substantial difference, right? A difference of 148 HU. That's way above 20. So that's definitely enhancing. So when you see a renal mass with this level of robust enhancement, you think renal cell carcinoma, particularly the clear cell subtype, can cause that level of enhancement. Now, if I just back up a minute, remember the cortical medullary phase I mentioned? So that's not always included as a part of routine protocol. It differs from institution, but it can be quite useful. And again, that occurs about 40 seconds after contrast. So that's handy because it really gives you a nice look at the cortical medullary pattern throughout the kidney. So you could, you could identify pseudotumors like a column of Bertin or a dromedary hump things that um, on the nephrographic phase might be slightly confusing. Um, also remember that renal cell metastases tend to be hypervascular and they like to go to the liver, pancreas and adrenal glands. So this is a great phase to pick that up. And notice too that even though we're in the cortical medullary phase, this is also kind of the arterial portal phase of the liver where we have the portal veins and the hepatic arteries enhancing and it's the best phase to pick up hypervascular liver masses. Also, the pancreatic parenchymal phase is usually about this time as well. So it's a good look at the pancreas. And again, the spleen here, even though we don't see it on the axials, you can see it has that kind of tiger stripey appearance, that arsiform enhancement pattern that we also see around this time. And that's due to the difference between the red and white pulp. And uh, for surgical planning, this phase is also handy because it is kind of an arterial phase. So you can identify the number of 
renal arteries, you know, if a patient's having a nephrectomy or even a partial nephrectomy. And as we saw earlier, vas vascular malformation, pseudoaneurysms of the kidney, you pick up quite well on the cortical medullary phase. So here's just an example. This was a patient who ended up having a renal cell carcinoma that was clear cell subtype. And you can really nicely see the solitary left renal artery on this cortical medullary phase for surgical planning. A different patient here, do you notice anything on this cortical medullary phase? It's a little subtle, but there is some enhancing lesions here in the pancreatic head uh, and uncenter process region that were hypervascular renal cell metastases. So uh, this can be much harder to detect on the standard portal venous or nephrographic phase. Uh, here's kind of a, a scary example. If we look at this non-contrast phase, we don't really see much here in the left kidney, right? On the nephrographic phase, you might wonder what's this hazy hypodensity here in the interpolar area. But on the cortical medullary phase, you catch this lobular hypervascular mass here. That's, uh, that's the AVM we saw earlier. So this is really a, a great phase to pick this up. Renal AVMs can be hard to pick up on a, a standard renal mass protocol unless you have a high index of suspicion. Because what's happening here is you get this arterial enhancement and then the draining vein drains it. So now this is enhancing kind of similar to the renal vein, which is enhancing, but not quite as bright as the kidney. And these are much easier to pick up on MRI because you'll, you'll see the flow void, the T2 dark flow void at the level of the AVM as well. That's another clue. So yeah, again, the cortical medullary phase is great for that. But you really need that nephrographic phase as a baseline. And that's why most renal mass protocols have just a non-con and a nephrographic phase, just to minimize radiation and to cover all the major bases. Because again, you could miss small renal masses because they can hide in the medullary pyramids. So here on this cortical medullary phase, we're not seeing this lesion quite as well as we do as it's outlined on the nephrographic phase. All right, so now I'll talk about how to evaluate renal masses on MRI. So here we're looking at a left renal mass. This is T1 and T2 weighted images. You can see the mass there. And I usually look at the CSF first when I'm trying to decide what sequence I'm looking at rather than cheat and look at the, <laughs> the actual title of the sequence. This is also helpful for boards. And you can see fluid will be bright on T2, so look at the CSF and dark on T1. And this lesion is following the signal of CSF, right? So it's simple fluid. So that's reassuring. And then on post-contrast uh, T1 fat suppressed series, you can see it's not enhancing. So this is just a simple cyst. If you, if you had doubts, <laughs> the patient also had a CT and the density of that was nine. So again, that's, that's less than 20. We can be confident that that's a simple cyst. Now, what about this lesion? So here we're looking at T1 and T2. So is this following CSF density? Well, this is bright on T1, it should be dark, right? And this is T2 bright, but it's not quite as bright as T2. There's a little decreased signal in there. So this doesn't look like a simple cyst. If we give gadolinium, it's kind of difficult to say, is this enhancing or not? It's, it's bright, but it's not as bright as the kidney. Could it be hypo-enhancing? Well, this is where subtraction images are key, where we do post-processing to subtract the post-contrast and the pre-contrast images. So all you're left with are, is true enhancement. So anything on the subtraction image that's bright is enhancing and anything that's black is actually not, it's been subtracted out. So you can see this lesion is completely dark. It's not enhancing. And so we can confidently call this a hemorrhagic or a protonaceous cyst. And it can be a little, tricky if you don't have subtraction images making this differentiation, but it's key if you have anything that's bright to begin with on T1 to get a subtraction image, because it's hard to tell, is there enhancement under there or not? So there are specific criteria for contrast enhancement on MRI. If you, have, if you measure the uh, signal intensity with the region of interest, if the difference between the non-contrast and the post-contrast is 15% or more, then you can be confident that that's enhancement. But usually you can just kind of eyeball it. <laughs> if you see any visible signal on the post-contrast subtraction images, then there's enhancement. It should be totally black, assuming that there's not misregistration artifact. If the patient moves in between the pre-contrast and the post-contrast, that could throw off your subtraction images and you're stuck. 
But MRI is, is excellent at definitely characterizing cystic renal lesions by identifying the enhancing soft tissue components. So here you can see this part's T1 dark and T2 bright within this complex left renal mass. Here's the aorta here. And then we have this lobular soft tissue around it that's kind of intermediate in T1 and T2 signal. But when we give post contrast evaluation on these T1 fat suppressed images, you can see the cystic area remains dark. It's not enhancing, but then this lobular soft tissue around it is enhancing. There's mural nodularity and a regular enhancing wall thickening. That's classic for a cystic renal cell carcinoma. So MRI can definitively characterize those complex lesions. So you might be wondering, well, when, when should we get CT or MRI for renal mass? And generally CT with and without contrast is the most commonly used imaging modality to characterize indeterminate renal lesions, mainly because it's readily available and much less expensive than MRI. And it's better at, visual and sorry, better at visualizing calcifications, which can sometimes be difficult to see on MRI. On the other hand though, the studies have shown that MRI is actually more sensitive to contrast enhancement and may detect enhancing tumor that can be obscured by coarse calcifications on CT. So that point might not be as valid, but the fact that it's so readily available and inexpensive makes it a great tool. There are certain times though when MRI is the way to go. And probably the most important is if you have a small renal lesion. So a lesion that's uh, less than two centimeters or especially less than 1.5 centimeters and if it's completely intrarenal, and that's because you'll get that effective pseudo enhancement that I mentioned before, where it will artificially increase the density. So basically, if you have a lesion that's indeterminate on ultrasound or a, a non-renal mass protocol CT, and it's, it measures 1.5 centimeters, definitely go to an MRI because you don't want to then have to recommend an additional study after the CT doesn't accurately characterize it. And it's also a great problem solving tool, particularly for those complex cystic masses that we saw, or if you have a, an indeterminate hyperdense cystic lesion on CT, because subtractions on CT are not as feasible. MRI does a much better job at that. Also, patients that have uh, iodinated intravenous contrast allergy, rather than doing a steroid prep, MRI might be a better option. And then if you have young patients who might need multiple follow-up imaging studies because there's no radiation with MRI, and that's for lesions if they have uh, like a Bosniak category 2F lesion, like an indeterminate but probably benign renal mass where you would have follow-up potentially for several years. And patients that have conditions that will predispose them to renal cancer like nephroblastomatosis, von Hippel-Lindau, or tuberous sclerosis. Patients who get multiple studies, MRI might be a better option. And so some of the limitations of MRI if patient motion can really limit the study. So when I'm recommending a follow-up study for imaging for a lesion, I take, try to take that into account. If it's an older patient that can barely stay still for a, a CT scan, it's very unlikely that that patient will be able to stay still for a half hour to get an MRI, and you might have a really limited study. So in that case, I might lean more towards CT. And also, as we mentioned, calcifications can be difficult to see and then the cost and availability of MRI is not as great. All right, so let's do a practical example that kind of sums up a lot of these things. So this was a patient who had a non-contrast CT. We have a small hyperdense intrarenal lesion here measuring about 11 millimeters. So here's the cortical medullary phase and notice how it's hidden there. <laughs> but on the nephrographic phase, we see it nicely demarcated surrounded by contrast. So now we'll do the renal mass evaluation on non-contrast imaging. It measures 93 console units, so quite dense. And on post-contrast, it's 108. And of course, that difference is 15, which falls into that gray zone of enhancement, right? If it's more than 10 and less than 20, that's kind of in, in, indeterminate for true enhancement. So the patient had an MRI, and you can see on T1-weighted images, it's T1 bright, so not following simple fluid of CSF. And then on T2, it's dark, so also not following CSF. So not a simple cyst. We do post-contrast images, and it's not enhancing as much as the kidney, but I'm not confident that it's not enhancing at all. So what can we do there? Subtractions. So the patient had subtractions, and you can see the lesion's now black, and it's not enhancing. So this was a nice example of a small hemorrhagic proteinaceous cyst and why 
you should avoid CT for small lesions, particularly if they're intrarenal because of that uh, pseudo enhancement, because we don't have pseudo enhancement with MRI. Another alternative, if a patient has a hyperattenuating cyst on CT, if the patient can't get ionated contrast or gadolinium for some reason, you could do an ultrasound because sometimes uh, ultrasound can clarify a hyperdense cyst on CT. Non-contrast MRI sometimes cannot be able to differentiate a hemorrhagic cyst from a solid tumor. Uh, but um, if, if the signal intensity on T1 is 2.5 times that, the signal intensity of the kidney, the adjacent renal parenchyma, then you can call that a hyperdense cyst or a, a uh, hemorrhagic proteinaceous cyst on MRI. And that's based on the, the latest uh, 2019 Bosniak guidelines. You can see though, in this case, just by eyeballing this, this lesion is, is bright, but it doesn't look like it's 2.5 times as bright as the renal parenchyma. So that, that wouldn't work in this case. If we had just done a non-contrast MRI on this patient, we wouldn't be able to accurately characterize this lesion. Now you may be saying, well, Dr. Koval, did we even need to do any follow-up for this lesion? And we did not, you're right. So based on that uh, ACR incidental, <clears throat> excuse me, based on the ACR incidental renal mass management guidelines, if you have a homogeneous non-contrast lesion on uh, non-contrast series and it measures 70 Hanfeld units or more, as in this case, this is 93. That's almost always a hyperdense Bosniak II cyst and does not need any further evaluation. So this patient actually did not need any additional imaging if you apply this rule. And that's because it's very unlikely for a renal neoplasm to have that high density on non-contrast series. As far as being homogeneous, you can have a, a renal mass, like a renal cell carcinoma that can hemorrhage and have elevated density but that would not be homogeneous. As long as it's homogeneous, then you can call it a hyperdense cyst. So just to summarize the non-contrast hyperdense, uh, sorry, the non-contrast Hounsfield unit density. So if it's less than 20, 20 or less, you do not need any follow-up. It's a simple cyst. If it's 70 or more, you do not need any follow-up. It's a hyperdense cyst. And if it's 21 to 69, that's indeterminate. It could be a renal neoplasm and needs follow-up. And then one thing I haven't mentioned yet is what about portal venous phase density? If you just have a portal venous phase study, which is what most of our routine CT adrenaline and pelvis scans are, right? And you have a homogeneous lesion, what density can you dismiss those tumors? Well, based on the revised Bosniak uh, criteria put forth by Dr. Silverman, if the density is 21 to 30, you could assume that's a benign cyst and not follow it up. And that's because the thought of that is, remember we talked about pseudo enhancement and that you should have a density of 10 or more to call true enhancement or, or where you start getting worried about enhancement. If a cyst is about 20 on uh, non-con and then it goes up to around 30, then that's kind of within the, the range of normal on portal venous phase. So this is kind of a newer guideline and this is helpful because we often run into these lesions where they might measure like 26 Hanfeld units on a routine CT and you're like, well, what do we do with that? It's probably a cyst. Um, you, could, you could consider not following these up. All right, so now I'll move on to renal cell carcinoma since that's kind of what we're often worried about when we're doing these renal mass protocols. So renal cell carcinoma is the most common primary renal malignancy and their risk factors include smoking, exposure to petroleum and asbestos, uh, hypertension and chronic dialysis. And this is a patient with clear cell renal cell carcinoma. When we are evaluating patients with renal cell carcinoma, there are certain staging things you wanna look for that will alter management. So one is if you see renal vein or especially inferior vena cable invasion, so what's the most common tumor to invade the renal vein? It is renal cell carcinoma. So uh, whenever you have a suspected renal cell malignancy, look closely at the renal vein to see if there's any invasion. Other tumors that can commonly invade the renal vein uh, are the adrenal cortical carcinomas like to do that. And then leiomyosarcomas, whether they're um, intrinsic to the IVC or if it's a retroperineal leiomyosarcoma, they can invade into the, the renal vein. Uh, 
Uh, we also look for regional lymph node involvement for staging. And then you want to mention if there's any direct organ invasion outside of Gerota's fascia. And if you do have IVC invasion, you want to evaluate to see if it extends superiorly and reaches the right atrium, because that will also obviously stage the patient differently. And for metastatic disease, there's a certain pattern that renal cell carcinoma commonly goes to. So lung is the most common site. So here's a patient with metastatic renal carcinoma to the lung, uh, followed by bone and then lymph nodes but then also liver. And the, the liver is interesting because you see that best on the, these are hypervascular meds, so you'll see that best on that late hepatic arterial phase, which is like an arterial portal phase. And these can be very difficult to see on the routine portal venous phase that, that we usually do for just conventional CTs. So if you have a patient with renal cell carcinoma getting follow-up, you may wanna get a, an early arterial phase evaluation of the liver. And then adrenal is another common spot. You can see this patient had a right adrenal metastasis, also hypervascular. And then the brain renal cell often goes to that location. This patient had a supratentorial metastasis there on the left. This is a different patient with uh, multiple hemorrhagic or hypervascular renal cell carcinoma metastases from a, a left primary malignancy. And you can see these scattered throughout the brain stem and this was actually uh, six years after nephrectomy for the initial renal cell carcinoma. And that's a, a problem with renal cell. You could see delayed metastatic disease. So even once you're five years out, that you should still look very closely at the images to make sure you're not missing some delayed metastases. I think the longest I've seen for a delayed met was a history of renal cell carcinoma 20 years prior and then presenting with metastases. Now, I had mentioned metastases to bone. So do you notice anything on this bone scan? This is a frontal projection, whole body bone scan. You might notice there's some vague uptake in the mid diaphysis of the left femur there. There's some vague areas of rib uptake. This might be degenerative uptake in the shoulders. So you might be wondering if there's some at least mild metastatic disease, but then when we look at the CT scan, the patient actually had this the same day. You can see there's this large lytic metastasis destroying the right humeral head. We also see lytic metastases involving the posterior elements of the upper thoracic spine there. Throughout the lumbar spine, look at all these metastases and these large lytic lesions destroying the cortex here of the bilateral iliac bones and sacrum, but very underwhelming on the x-ray, I'm sorry, the bone scan. Here's the coronal reformatted CT to compare, just showing that extensive uh, lytic metastatic disease. And that's because bone scan will significantly underestimate lytic metast metastatic disease. It's really a marker of osteoblastic activity. So the activity you're seeing here is the bony remodeling adjacent to the lytic femoral metastasis. So just keep that in mind when you're reading bone scans for renal cell carcinoma. Also transitional cell carcinoma can be uh, lytic and underwhelming. Now there's also a set of commonly uncommon metastatic sites for renal cell carcinoma where they don't occur frequently, but they do occur enough that you should be familiar with them. And it's kind of a predictable pattern. So one is this patient on this initial CT, this is kind of an early portal venous phase. You might notice there's a subtle uh, left, a subtle pancreatic tail hypervascular mass there that uh, slowly grew and seven years later, you can see it's a larger hypervascular pancreatic tail mass here. So pancreatic um, tumors, the renal cell can metastasize to that organ. So what's the most common metastasis to the pancreas? Renal cell carcinoma. Yes, you can see my, we have a theme here. Here's a different case. This is the one I showed you earlier with these multiple hypervascular uh, metastases to the, the pancreatic head. And again, you see this best on like an arterial cortical medullary phase. Um, here's another location that renal cell can occasionally go to. This was an MRI of the lumbar spine, T1 fat suppressed with contrast. Do you notice anything? Well, here is a hypervascular mass here in the right paraspinal muscle, larger mass in the left paraspinal muscle that's also tracking along the, the superior fascial plane. So intramuscular metastases, renal cell carcinoma, is also known for a different patient here with these large bilateral source muscle 
metastases with some surrounding uh, atrophy due to the expansile nature of these masses. So this is something else that if you're not uh, carefully looking for, you might overlook because they can be subtle and only mildly enhancing relative to the uh, surrounding muscle tissue. Uh, this is a different patient. Here we're looking at a non-contrast CT of the chest. We're at the carina here. And notice there's a meniscus at the right main bronchus here. There's a mass filling that lesion. This is a minimum intensity projection, a 3D reformatted volume rendered series. You can see the meniscus very nicely here. And it's causing obstruction here, this post-obstructive right lower lobe uh, atelectasis here. And on the 3D endobronchoscopic fly through, this is how it would look. So this is corresponding to this lesion here. And this turned out to be a renal cell carcinoma metastasis. So it can cause endobronchial metastases. So when you're, when you're looking at the lungs for renal cell mets, which is more common, don't forget to also closely look at the airways. Now that's, that wouldn't be my first uh, differential if we just had this image in isolation, right? Bronchogenic carcinoma is a much more common tumor to have, to have uh, endobronchial spread. Also uh, carcinoid, the, the typical carcinoid tends to involve the medial third of the, the lungs and airways. And then other metastases you would also think about like breast, endometrial and colon cancer, but renal cell can also give that appearance. All right, so I'll talk about some of the subtypes now of renal cell carcinoma. So according to the, the 2016 WHO classification, uh, it's divided into clear cell carcinoma, papillary cell carcinoma, chromophobe cell carcinoma, and then renal medullary carcinoma is less common. And then there are many others, some new ones um, for this particular classification like papillary clear cell. The collecting duct is incredibly rare. So I'm going to just focus on these three since these are the ones you will run into frequently and can be differentiated somewhat on imaging. So here we have a, this is actually a, three-phase renal mass protocol. We have a non-contrast image here showing this exophytic mass arising from the kidney. It's heterogeneously hypervascular. And then uh, this is a nephrographic phase. It's actually a combined nephrographic excretory phase. And we're seeing a bit of washout, which can occur with renal malignancies. We normally think of lesion washout with hepatocellular carcinoma of the liver, right? But it can also occur with renal tumors and is concerning for malignancy. So clear cell is the most common subtype of renal cell by far. It's, it's at 70% to 80% of all renal cells. And of those three major subtypes that I mentioned, it has the worst prognosis. The five-year survival is only 30%. Medullary cell carcinoma has a worse prognosis than that, but that's very rare. And it's important to note that these can be multifocal or bilateral, uh, particularly in hereditary syndromes like patients with von Hippel-Lindau. That's, that's one of the more common ones. So if you find one lesion, carefully look to see if there are more. And here are just three different examples of renal cell, clear cell carcinoma, just to give you uh, an apparent, a, to familiarize you with the different patterns. So they're usually hypervascular and enhance much more strongly than other renal cell carcinoma subtypes. Uh, and as <clears throat> we saw in those earlier examples, they tend to be very hypervascular. They can be heterogeneous with necrosis. You can see these central necrotic areas here in these uh, renal cell carcinomas. So that's kind of the typical appearance for renal cell. Uh, now here's a case example. This was an elderly male who came into the emergency department for other reasons. And incidentally, we found these hypervascular masses in the right kidney. And you can see there's not just one there in the interpolar area, there are two. And uh, this was a aortic phase study, which also gives us a cortical medullary phase, so they're very hypervascular. So you would be thinking uh, clear cell carcinoma, and as I had mentioned, they can be multifocal like in this case. So this patient actually deferred treatment at that time, but then came back to the emergency department with flank pain about two and a half years later. And what are you seeing here? Well, there's now this subcapsular hematoma and all this perinephric hemorrhage extensively throughout the the right retroperitoneum here, completely engulfing the right kidney at the site of those masses. So this patient went to the OR at this point and it was found to be multifocal clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And this was spontaneous rupture or hemorrhage. And what's that called when you have uh, spontaneous non-traumatic renal hemorrhage into the subcapsular and perirenal spaces? 
I believe this was a YouTube question on Radio Guyan recently, right? <laughs> yes, it is Wunderlich syndrome. So not very common, but just keep in mind that renal cell carcinoma can present with spontaneous hemorrhage. So now how does renal cell clear cell look on MRI? Well, here's a T2 fat suppressed series. You can see it's T2 because the CSF is bright and the fat is dark, so it's fat suppressed. And this mass is heterogeneously T2 bright. And it's dark on T1, but then very hypervascular on the post-contrast T1 weighted images. So a T2 hyperintense hypervascular renal mass is very suspicious for clear cell renal cell carcinoma. But there's something else that can make us even uh, make this diagnosis with higher specificity. And that's if we look at the chemical shift imaging, which is the in-phase and out-of-phase series. So I coned in on this mass and you can see on the in-phase lesions, uh, in-phase series, it's heterogeneous. It's got areas of brightness and darkness. Then, then on the opposed phase series, what happens? Well, you can see that those areas that were bright are now dark. So they're dropping out. This area that was bright here is now dark on the opposed phase. So that tells you that there's this microscopic fat within the, the mass. So these, these clear cell types of renal cell have abundant cytoplasmic granules of fat or glycogen, and that will actually stain clear on H&E stains. So that's why they're called clear cell, clever. <laughs> and then uh, because of this cytoplasmic microscopic fat, you'll get this decreased signal on opposed phase images, it will drop out. And so if you, we don't always see this with clear cell, but when you do, especially in the setting of a T2 bright hypervascular mass, you can say with a fair degree of certainty that you're probably dealing with clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Now compared to this lesion, this is a, a different patient. This is the non-contrast CT. We're coned in down to the right kidney. And we see this uh, heterogeneous mass here with multiple amorphous calcifications. And this is a typical appearance for a papillary renal cell carcinoma. So papillary is the second most common renal cell carcinoma subtype up to about 20% and has a better prognosis than clear cell. Also tends to calcify more commonly than clear cell. And if we do a renal mass evaluation, this mass measures 43 on the non-contrast. So that's above 20. So it's not a simple cyst. Also it's calcified. And then it goes up to 66 on the post-contrast series. So that's a difference of 26. That's more than 20. So that's true enhancement. And this was a papillary tumor. So these will enhance typically less than clear cell. Remember some of those clear cell cases I showed you were over 100 difference. This is, this is fairly mild. So these tend to be hypovascular and enhance homogeneously. They don't look quite as scary as clear cell renal cell carcinoma does. Uh, and here's an example. This is a patient who had a renal mass on an ultrasound on the portal venous, or sorry, nephrographic phase scan. This is axial and coronal. We see this mass that's fairly homogeneous. And is it enhancing? Is it hypovascular? Well, we would need to do a renal mass protocol for that. So you can see on the non-contrast series, it measures 22 and goes up to 24. I'm sorry, 44 here. So that's a difference of only 22 which is pretty low, but it is above 20. Remember, that's the threshold for enhancement. And this turned out to be a papillary renal cell. This is probably the lowest enhancing papillary renal cell that I've encountered in clinical practice. But uh, just keep this in mind, because these are the lesions I worry about missing. If you're reading a CT and you think, could this just be a hyperdense cyst? Think, could this be a hypovascular papillary renal cell carcinoma? Now, MRI for papillary, these lesions will typically be T2 dark. And that's because there's this byproducts of hemorrhage like hemosiderin and fibrous tissue that is characteristic for these tumors. And you can see it's also, there it is again on regular T2. Here's T2 fat suppressed, it's quite dark. And then when we give gadolinium, it's enhancing, but it's pretty hypovascular. It's not super bright like that clear cell renal cell that we saw. Now, can chemical shift, art of, uh, chemical shift imaging help us with papillary subtypes? Well, let's take a look. Whoops, sorry. So on the in-phase here, you see the mass. This is that same mass exophytically arising from the interpolar right kidney. And then when we look at the out-of-phase series, 
we don't really see any dropout, right? It's, it's actually the opposite that we're seeing. It's darker on the in-phase T1 than on the out-of-phase. So why is that? Well, with uh, papillary tumors, you get this susceptibility artifact or blooming due to the cytoplasmic or interstitial he, uh, histiocytic chemosiderin, that, that those old blood products that we had talked about earlier. And you can think of the in-phase T1 series here as kind of like T2 star-like sequences, meaning that susceptibility artifact will be magnified on them. They're not like the, the true susceptibility weighted imaging series we would do for like a neural brain MRI, but they do have a lot of this T2 star susceptibility effect. So they're great for looking at like gas and metal. Those will all bloom like a dark black cloud. So you'll see gas in the bowel will bloom more on the in phase, uh, metal if you have surgical clips or air elsewhere, and then also this hemosiderin within papillary renal cell. So if you have this appearance, it's, it's quite suggestive of papillary. And here's just another case just to reinforce that appearance. So this patient had a T2 hypo intense mass here rising exophytically from the left kidney. And that was hypovascular on post contrast tumor weighted images. And then when we do in and out of phase, you can see little dots of susceptibility throughout the mass. On the out of phase, we don't see that. We don't see any dropout. We see more darkness on the in phase, so that's susceptibility. So this is highly suggestive of a papillary renal cell carcinoma, and it was biopsied, and that's what it was. So just to summarize clear cell versus uh, papillary, Clear cell is T2 bright and hypervascular and might have this microscopic cytoplasmic fat that will show dropout and become darker on the opposed phase. Also remember, clear cell is more common and has a worse prognosis. Papillary, there will be T2 dark and hypovascular and that cytoplasmic hemosiderin could show susceptibility artifact and become darker on the in phase. So they're kind of conveniently opposite of each other and uh, that should help you remember how to differentiate the two. And it's important to differentiate the two because the prognosis is so different. So if you have a patient that's not a great surgical candidate or maybe already has one kidney and you can identify a mass as probably papillary as opposed to clear cell, less aggressive treatment might be indicated. All right, so I'll talk about the final uh, subtype of those big three now, the chromophobe subtype. So this is the third most common and it has the best prognosis. The five-year survival is 90%, which is great. And these, like papillary, will enhance less than clear cell and tend to be homogeneous. So you can see how homogeneous this mass is compared to the clear cell we saw earlier. And metastases and venous invasion are rare. And so when we evaluate this same lesion with the renal mass protocol, the difference between the non-con and the post-contrast is 64. So that's decent enhancement. So let's uh, apply some of what we've learned here on this practical example. So this is a patient, we have a portal venous or nephrographic phase study here, and there's a few renal lesions. We have a right lesion, a left one, and one at the left lower pole. So let's just break it down one lesion at a time. Uh, here, these are non-contrast series up above and post-contrast series below in the nephrographic phase. So this lesion above goes from nine Hounsfeld units on non-con to 13 on post-contrast. That's just a simple cyst. It, you already knew it was a simple cyst because it was less than 20 to begin with on non-contrast. This lesion though was 45 to begin with. So that's not a simple cyst and it's too low. Uh, I'm sorry, it's too, it's too high to be considered a simple cyst and it goes up to 81. That's a difference of 36 and it's homogeneous. And this turned out to be a chromophobe subtype of renal cell carcinoma. And this lesion is 18 on non-contrast and goes to 18 on post-contrast. So it stays the same. It has no difference. That's a fairly simple cyst uh, because it's approaching 20. That's when you start thinking about hemorrhagic proteinaceous cyst, but this is benign and needs no follow-up. And you may be wondering, well, why, why are we not getting any pseudo enhancement with this lesion compared to this, this cyst? And that's because this lesion is quite exophytic. It doesn't have any adjacent enhancing renal tissue that can cause streak artifact across that and artifactually raise the density, whereas this lesion does, this density can streak across and cause some mild elevation in density. Oh, and one other comment about when you place an ROI, it should take up about 50% of the lesion because you don't want to make a little tiny ROI like this. That, that might be, give you a spurious result. And ideally you want to have the, the lesion above and below where you're measuring so you don't get volume averaging with adjacent parenchyma or fat.
Now there's one weird variant of chromophobe that I just want to mention. And it looks like this. So this was a patient, we're looking at a coronal non-enhanced CT and there's this uh, large mass-like area arising exophytically from the upper pole left kidney with this amorphous calcification. And then on post-contrast images, this, it looks like there's inflammatory change around it and it's also hypovascular. Is it enhancing? It's hard to tell, but on subtraction images, it does look like it's hypo-enhancing. It's not totally black like CSF, it's kind of grayish. And you know, this is a little confusing looking. You might wonder, could this be xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis? Because that can often have calcification and inflammatory change. Could it be like squamous cell carcinoma? Because that is a less common type of renal tumor that often occurs in the setting of urothelial irritation from calcification. But this ended up being a chromophobe. And this actual subtype has been described. There was a, a paper by Dr. Kim that if you have a large tumor more than seven centimeters and it's homogeneously weak in enhancement and calcified, that's actually strongly suggestive of chromophobe. So it's uh, just an odd variant to keep in mind. All right, so just to summarize those major renal cell subtypes. So the most common in descending order is clear cell. And that's followed by papillary chromophobe medullary carcinoma, which we didn't talk about, but that tends to occur only in patients uh, who have sickle cell trait. And the best prognosis in descending order is chromophobe, papillary, and clear cell, followed by medullary, which has the worst. All right. So now I'll finish with benign renal neoplasms, and we'll talk about oncocytoma and AML. So here's a patient. This was a middle-aged male who had a CT for other reasons, but you could see that there is a left exophytic renal mass and it has a central scar, a hypodense area. This is also a nice look at the renal fascia here. There's the anterior renal fascia coming in. And you can see how it's joined by the lateral coronal fascia to form the posterior renal fascia. Here's a different patient with the same diagnosis, but in the other kidney, this is a much larger tumor that looks somewhat aggressive here. Uh, arising from the left kidney, also has this hypodense stellate central scar, and these were both oncocytomas. So these are 5% of renal tumors. They're actually the most common benign solid renal tumor. So it's a, it's a benign renal cell neoplasm. It's the benign equivalent of renal cell carcinoma. And the central scar that we often talk about is actually not that common. It only occurs in about a third of the patients. And it's this central a uh, stellate area of fibrosis or connective tissue, and it has these compressed blood vessels. So these compressed blood vessels can sometimes give you a spoke wheel pattern that was classically described on angiography, like conventional angio, but sometimes you can see it on ultrasound, particularly if you're using microvascular flow imaging or even power Doppler. Um, so the, the thing is though, you don't wanna be swayed by the central scar. You, these tumors are generally considered indistinguishable from renal cell carcinoma on imaging, but they can usually be resected uh, by renal sparing surgery, like a partial nephrectomy. So here's a quiz. So which one do you think is the renal cell carcinoma? We have a hypovascular solid mass on the right, and then we have this mass on the left that looks well circumscribed with a central scar. So probably an oncocytoma, right? No, <laughs> this was an oncocytoma on the right with no central scar. This was actually a renal cell carcinoma, clear cell subtype with a central scar. So do not be fooled by a mass with a central scar in the kidney. Uh, you have to assume it's clear cell, renal cell, or just renal cell in general until proven otherwise. Now, what about uh, these two patients? One is renal cell and one is oncocytoma. Here we have this hypovascular solid mass on the uh, right hand side in the left kidney. And on the left here, we have this hypervascular mass at the lower pole. So this was actually oncocytoma and this was renal cell papillary subtype. So these are difficult to differentiate and uh, surgery is often required. There was a study a while ago that uh, talked about the possibility of segmental enhancement inversion as a way to differentiate, meaning that Parts of an oncocytoma would flip-flop with the way they enhanced, but um, other studies since then have shown that that was not a reliable feature, and it's also found in renal cell carcinoma. Uh, 
so that it's not a clear way to differentiate. All right, so let's look at this case. This is a different patient, left kidney. We're looking at an ultrasound, and we see a heterogeneously echogenic mass here. On CT, you can see it's quite exophytic, and it has uh, areas of fat density similar to the adjacent intra-abdominal fat and also soft tissue around it. Here's a different example, a echogenic mass in the interpolar kidney. And on CT, this one is homogeneous fat density, isodensity adjacent perinephric fat. So when we measure that density, it's negative 82. So that's quite low. This is diagnostic of a lipid-rich angiomyolipoma. So AMLs are the most common benign mesenchymal neoplasms. They're composed of fat, smooth muscle, and blood vessels in varying amounts. So uh, this is one which is fat predominant, whereas others, the one we saw earlier, had a mix. And these are uh, quite specifically diagnosed on CT when we see this macroscopic fat. Usually the density will be much less than 30, but you often don't even have to measure it. You can just eyeball this and see that it's the same density as the perinephric fat. But if you do measure it, it should measure much less than negative 30. Here's a different patient with an AML. This one's primarily um, uh, smooth muscle and blood vessels, but does have some fat. It's a relatively lipid poor AML. So on ultrasound, the small AMLs are usually uniformly hyperechoic. And it's important though, to compare these to prior CT scans. Uh, and I'll explain why in a second. Larger AMLs might be more heterogeneous, uh, but a small renal cell carcinoma can present as a homogeneous echogenic mass in 10%. So uh, most renal cells will not be homogeneous and echogenic, but the small ones, 10% of the time, can mimic an AML. So if there is a prior CT, it's handy to compare. Keep in mind that sometimes the mass will look a little larger on ultrasound just because you get a bit of a blooming effect um, because of the echogenic mass and the difference in resolution compared to how it might look on CT. Uh, but that won't occur with larger lesions. There is a potentially helpful feature on ultrasound that AMLs about a third of the time will show posterior acoustic shadowing. Like in this case, this was a, here's the uh, liver here. This is the kidney with a exophytic AML. You can see there's some posterior acoustic shadowing there that does kind of point you more towards um, AML as opposed to renal cell. But this feature isn't always that helpful. In this case, this was a patient with tuberous sclerosis, which uh, those patients have a much higher propensity to form AMLs and they can be extremely large. So that's another clue that we're dealing with an AML in this case. So let's go back to that chemical shift that we talked about before. So how does an AML look on in-phase and out-of-phase images? So at first glance here, this is the in-phase, here's the out-of-phase. You don't see any real change on the internal contents of this lesion. We do see that the the liver here is dropping out on the out of phase. So that's showing us that we have some, some fat, fatty liver. We're also seeing some physiologic dropout in the bone marrow here of the spine. So even though the, the spine, the axial skeleton is mostly red marrow in an adult, it is still fatty marrow. So you, will, you should see normal dropout there. But when we do a uh, fat suppressed series where the subcutaneous and intra-abdominal fat is suppressed, you do see that the, the AML drops out it becomes suppressed. And that becomes, that's because the AML has macroscopic fat. So macroscopic fat will be suppressed on fat suppressed series, whereas microscopic fat will be suppressed and drop out on the out of phase series. So let me just take a slight detour to explain how we look at lipid evaluation on MRI, because this is a, a key thing. When I was a resident, I thought that the in and out of phase sequences were really only good for adrenal adenomas and hepatic steatosis, but there's, there's a lot more you can glean from these two sequences. They're very powerful. So chemical shift imaging, when we use that term, we're really talking about these T1 weighted gradient echo sequences that I was just showing you. And it's the in phase and the opposed phase. And that's best. Uh, so if we're talking about microscopic fat, that refers to fat that is intracellular, intracytoplasmic or intravoxel. I'm sorry to give you all those terms, but you will see it referred to in this way in various uh, papers or attendings. They're all interchangeable. Some may argue one over the other. For simplicity's sake, I will just call this microscopic fat uh, for, this, for this lecture. So the microscopic fat we're looking at is hepatic steatosis should drop out on out-of-phase sequences. Uh, focal fatty infiltration of the pancreatic head 
which can be like a pseudo mess on CT. MRI is great at solving that problem. Adrenal adenomas, 70% of adrenal adenomas will be lipid rich and, and will have this microscopic fat. Uh, hepatic adenomas. Does anyone know which subtype of hepatic adenoma? Can you can think to yourself <laughs> which uh, subtype might have microscopic fat? It's the HNF1 alpha subtype. So not all hepatic adenomas, uh, just that particular subtype. And unfortunately, well-differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma can also have this appearance, but typically the liver will be cirrhotic in that case, so that can help you differentiate. And then as we saw earlier, clear cell renal cell carcinoma can sometimes have microscopic fat within it. So with uh, fat suppression, the, the technique we saw that will suppress the macroscopic fat, that will null the signal from subcutaneous and intra-abdominal fat. Um, also from AMLs, like we saw, dermoid cysts have this kind of macroscopic fat, <clears throat> adrenal myelolipomas, uh, and lipomas and liposarcomas. So this is kind of a comprehensive list of all the major things you should be looking for or considering when you're evaluating these chemical shift imaging. So the way I think about macroscopic fat, you can kind of think of it like CT fat. It's the fat that if you look at a CT scan and you say, oh, that's fat, like the subcutaneous and intra-abdominal fat, dermoid cyst, then that's kind of what we're talking about. That's the type of fat that will be suppressed with these fat suppressed series. So let's go back to that AML case here because there's actually more information we can get from this out of phase sequence. So notice, actually, let me go back. So notice how when we look at the in phase compared to the out of phase, it looks like we've taken a black magic marker and drawn around all the organs. That's known as India ink or etching artifact. And that's a clue that you're looking at an opposed phase image. If, if you're ever looking at an unlabeled image, this is a opposed phase human weighted series. So why are we seeing this, this artifact at the edge of the kidney? Uh, it's because it, it occurs at the interface of a macroscopic fat containing structure and a water containing structure. So even though the opposed phase sequence is really, we think about it for evaluating microscopic fat, we can use it also for macroscopic fat because of this artifact. So this artifact will only occur when we're at the interface of macroscopic fat and a water containing structure. So the water containing liver uh, has this artifact as it's adjacent to the intra-abdominal fat. The muscular of the uh, abdominal wall here has the artifact adjacent to the subcutaneous fat because it's macroscopic fat. So the fact that we see this etching artifact around this T1 bright lesion, just on this image alone can tell us this is an AML. And that's supremely helpful because if you have a patient who aborts the study early or it's just a limited study that might not have all the sequences you need, if you see this appearance, you know that you're dealing with, this is a macroscopic fat containing structure. So if this was uh, a T1 bright lesion that did not have this artifact around it, it could just be a hemorrhagic cyst like what we saw earlier. And again, you can see the fat suppression here. And then just one final thing, I won't get into too much more physics here. <laughs> the, the reason this is called out of phase or opposed phase is because we're dealing with uh, fat and water that's in the same voxel. So when you have fat and water in the same voxel, like things that have microscopic fat, uh, when you're on the in phase image, the hydrogen ions are, are aligned in the same direction as the magnetic field in both the fat and water. So the signal will be additive. On these sequences though, uh, the fat, the hydrogen ions in the fat and water, when it's in the same voxel, this intravoxel microscopic fat will be pointed in opposite directions and the signal will be nulled and become dark. So that's why we see dropout with the liver and the bone marrow here. But why we don't see any change with the macroscopic fat because that's only fat, right, in a voxel. It's not fat in water, it's just fat. So that's why we see that, that difference between the two. Um, so again, you can make the diagnosis just on this. So let's go back to CT before you get overdosed by MRI physics. <laughs> so this is a, a different example. Here we have a right renal mass here. It's exophytic, uh, rising from the lower pole of the right kidney. And on T1 in phase, we can see it here. It's kind of iso intense to the skeletal muscle. And then what do you see on the out of phase image? So we're seeing again that etching artifact, the India ink artifact. Do you see it extending between the mass and the kidney? 
No, we see it kind of around the edge. So we see it at this interface. So, so we know this is a macroscopic fat water containing interface. And here's the intra-abdominal fat. But because we don't see this interface between the, uh, between the kidney and the mass, we can't say that this has macroscopic fat. And this also did not fat suppress on a fat suppressed image. So this turned out to be a lipid poor AML. So these are a diagnostic dilemma. About 5% of angiomyolipomas will have no identifiable macroscopic fat, and we cannot make the diagnosis on imaging. And again, you won't see any fat suppression and like I'm showing you here, you will not see India ink artifacts between the mass and the kidney. So this, this could uh, be anything just based on these sequences. So the differential I would give in this case would be, uh, could be an oncocytoma, it could be a lipid poor AML. Uh, you'd also want to exclude like the hypovascular types of renal cell carcinoma, like clear cell and papillary. Those are kind of the four things you would consider. On the other hand, once I gave that differential, and the patient had prune belly syndrome, and when they removed that tumor, it turned out to be an undescended testicle. So you can't always be correct with the history. I don't recommend including that as part of your differential, but just uh, keep in mind that it could still be other things. Um, so again, you can't really reliably differentiate a lipid poor AML from renal cell carcinoma. It needs to be biopsied or closely followed. Now here's a, a complication of AML that you, you wanna be aware of, this is a patient that came in with severe left flank pain and there's this marked subcapsular and perinephric hemorrhage. And you can also see an underlying fatty tumor here. Here's the coronal reformatted image, also non-contrast, just tremendous retroperitoneal hematoma about this ruptured AML. <clears throat> so uh, what size of AML do you worry about before it ruptures? And this would be similar Actually, no, I'll take that back. So the, the size you worry about, if it's more than four centimeters, that's when the patient may need uh, preemptive embolization or resection. Less than four centimeters, there's less of a risk. Um, so again, less greater than four. Something else to look for, if you happen to see an aneurysm within the AML, which can occur, if that aneurysm gets larger than five millimeters, that's also an increased risk for hemorrhage. And so these are patients that should be referred either to interventional radiology or surgery uh, because they could have uh, rupture. So since we've now seen two cases of hemoperitoneum from ruptured renal masses, I'll just finish by giving you a quick summary of things to think about when you have non-traumatic hemoperitoneum. What, what tumors or situations would you worry about? Well, if it's, a, if it's a female patient of childbearing age, your first differential has to be ectopic pregnancy because you don't want to miss a ruptured ectopic pregnancy with hemoperitoneum. Often though, just hemorrhagic ovarian cysts can sometimes cause pretty significant hemoperitoneum. And then as we saw renal AML, so you would think more if that was a younger or middle-aged female presenting with uh, perinephric hemoperitoneum. Whereas as we saw the renal cell carcinoma, that would be more of an older male um, presenting with perinephric hematoma. And then we mentioned, uh, earlier hepatic adenomas, those can also sometimes present with hemoperitoneum. And it's the inflammatory subtype is the more common type that will rupture and cause hemoperitoneum, but really any adenoma as it increases in size has an increased risk of, of rupture and hemorrhage. All right, so that's it for, uh, Sorry. That's it for imaging of renal masses. I hope you found that useful and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Koval, for that wonderful talk. So Dr. Koval is an associate professor of radiology uh, and chief and medical director of ultrasound at Bay State Health Medical, uh, Bay State Health, Massachusetts. Apart from that, he's also uh, he he also has his own YouTube channel, a Radiologist Headquarters, and I'm sure you've bumped into one of his YouTube videos. Uh, the the more popular ones are the five cases in five minutes one at some point of time. So now you have a face uh, uh, to the uh, face to the name. And uh, if you haven't checked them out yet, uh, do check out his website, radiologisthq.com and his uh, YouTube channel. I've left a link to that uh, in the description. Uh, 
Uh, before uh, we end our talk, we had a couple of questions, Dr. Kowal, from the audience, if you don't mind answering. Sure. Um, so a few of them you answered uh, during the course of your talk, and uh, I, I forgot to mention, but uh, thank you for that phenomenal talk. Not only did you cover uh, a lot of renal pathologies, you also gave an overview of, uh, say, uh, companion uh, pathologies, which are very useful uh, for, uh, say, holistic uh, uh, approach and holistic learning, not just focused to the kidney. So thank you for that. Uh, uh, and um, so the first question we have from Fatima, she asks, uh, does inversion enhancement help in oncocytoma? Uh, yes, good question. Uh, I had yeah, I briefly touched on that. Yeah, when that paper, there was a study that came up that showed areas that might be hypoenhancing on the cortical medullary phase and then become enhancing on the delayed phase or vice versa, that that was going to be a specific feature to help you differentiate and identify a lesion as oncocytoma. And clinically, I did encounter a few cases where that seemed to help, but then uh, they subsequently came out with addition, additional studies that showed that was not that could also be seen with renal cell carcinoma. So unfortunately, that is not a helpful feature. And then the latest uh, ACR guidelines for renal mass evaluation did not include that as a reliable way to differentiate oncocytoma from clear cell or other renal, renal tumors. Agreed, like in my experience, um, in my teaching uh, has always been the same, that it's very difficult and uh, uh, it's always uh, call it a renal cell carcinoma unless proven otherwise. Yes. Yeah, and it can even be difficult on pathology uh, to differentiate sometimes. Oh, yes, yeah, sometimes. yes. Yeah, I think somebody mentioned uh, that in our, we had a very uh, active chat today and uh, they did talk about that even on pathology, uh, they can confuse for a renal cell carcinoma. Uh, a couple of questions on similar lines. Uh, I think I'll uh, bunch them together. Uh, okay. So Dr. Rahul Roshan uh, had asked uh, that the T1 and T2 signal and post-contrast image, are, uh, aren't they enough to say a proteinaceous or hemorrhagic And why do we need subtraction images? That was the first question. And on similar lines, uh, I think we can answer this together. Uh, Farha also asked, if papillary carcinoma enhances less, how do we differentiate it from hemorrhagic cysts? Uh, good. Yeah. So you're right. Uh, there are times when just T1 and T2 is enough to call it a hemorrhagic cyst, particularly if the if the T1 signal is 2.5 times the signal of the adjacent renal parenchyma. Um, that that according to the the Dr. Silverman's um, revised Bosniak 2019 criteria, you can you can call that a a hemorrhagic cyst. If it's less than that, there's still a good chance that it could be a hemorrhagic cyst, especially if it's smaller. And it's T2 dark, but when when you're when it's when you don't have that, you can't quite as confidently say it's definitely a hemorrhagic cyst and let it go. It, it likely is, but not not definitely. And for the hemorrhagic cyst versus a hypoenhancing renal mass, the hemorrhagic cyst shouldn't enhance at all. It, it should just be totally non-enhancing, especially on subtractions. It should just look like a black void. Um, thank you. I think those were the questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kowal, uh, again, for doing this on a Saturday morning. And uh, I'm sure uh, all our viewers have learned a lot about uh, renal pathologies. And not only that, a little bit of MRI physics to go with that. Uh, 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 and uh, make sure you check out uh, Dr. Kowal's website and YouTube channel. I've left a link to that in the description. And uh, if you're new here, we do these sessions every Saturday at 8 p.m. India time and 9.30 a.m. Uh, or 10.30 uh, Eastern time, depending on the daylight savings. Thank you, everybody, who has joined us today for this session. And we shall see you guys in our next one. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it.